So we're going to talk today about our children's stories. And I learned this from Leanne Wilbert. She held up a picture one time, a framed family picture. And in the framed family picture, she said, isn't this a great picture? And it was a picture that looked like this. And this is a child coming home. There's the whole family. It's a great picture. But is there something here missing? Yeah, there are people missing from this picture, aren't there? And people that child will be wanting to know about. If you actually, this is from a book I really like called Yaffe's Family. Maybe some of you have seen that. And if you actually go through the book, Beautifully illustrated, you have the people that this boy left behind. You know, the rest of the story. And how we really fill in through identity for kids. I just love the illustrations here. But the love or the trauma that that child has experienced before they came into your care is an important part of your taking adequate care of your child and helping them to achieve a full identity. What this talk is about is how do you go through that information with children when so many of the parts of a child's story are difficult. And so we put this conference presentation into the series um, today because we thought it might be helpful if we could work just very openly as a group on some of the scripts that we use, what we say, when do we say it, and so forth. Um, one of the things that I like to talk about for our kids is many times it's like a puzzle. We have some of the pieces, some are missing. Sometimes it's embarrassing to have missing puzzle pieces in our kids' stories, isn't it? Because we feel like we can't really take care of their need to know. And occasionally when we're in that inadequate situation, we don't feel like we can even talk about it. Almost as if we don't talk about it, it won't matter. I can think of a family recently that had a picture of the birth mother and in a move lost it. So when the child said, is there a picture of the birth mother that I could have? You know what they said? We don't have one. Well, in going through a photo album about six months ago, this girl said, who's this? It looks just like me. <laughs> Voila. But, you know, it, she felt so awkward, the parents felt so awkward that they didn't bring up that situation. You know, because they felt kind of bad about it. And I think, while that's a more extreme case, in many situations, there are pieces we don't have, we feel bad about it, we feel like kind of, if we don't bring up certain issues, if we don't bring up certain missing pieces in that child's story, then maybe that child won't miss them either. Maybe they won't think that they're that important. What do you think the kids end up thinking? That they're not important, or that their life matter, what they question is okay, that it's not okay to want those things, or they have to pretend to be okay in a situation that isn't. Uh, by the way, if people are looking for seats, there are about eight up here, you're gonna be up close and personal, and about another eight there, but I'm okay if you're okay coming on up here. So um, when we have children who have difficult information in their past, one of the things that we want to do is really process that information. There's some really good neuroscience to explain why. Number one is we found that if we talk about it, that helps children to um, run brain wiring so that they integrate that highly charged, really potent information, uh, they, they integrate that into their life story. And those integrated fibers that we run serve dual purpose for stress regulation, that is stress reduction. So when we have something very highly charged with children, um, like your birth parents are addicts, or your birth dad is in jail, or 
Your birth mother was a prostitute, you know, which often happens after people become addicted. As we work with kids on those pieces, then that information, as it's given, is given in a comfortable context as, as it can be. And we're relying on the well-balanced brain of the person who's working on this information with us to keep that child as regulated as they can be. That, and when I use regulation, I mean just balanced as they can be, given the circumstances. They're able to put their thoughts and feelings about that situation together. They get assistance with the abstract thinking of the parent. And they're able to process it in a way that then, when they think about it later, is it helps them um, down regulate, that is reduce the high stress around that, the potency around that. It's somehow just not as bad the next day. Does that make sense? And so Dan Siegel is the person who's been talking about this at his conferences. You may have heard him. He's a really wonderful attachment, trauma uh, psychologist, or actually psychiatrist who's world famous. Anyway, so rather than opening a can of worms for our kids, it's preventing a buildup of unprocessed and high stress thoughts and feelings. But there are some things that are abstract and hard to explain addiction, poverty, lack of choice, cultural biases. And if kids have those situations in their lives and we don't talk about them, they tend to arrive at their own conclusions based on their fund of information they have just through their own lives. And how much information do they really have to draw from? Not a lot. You know, so when we're explaining some of these issues to them, we'll explain it differently at different ages, but we don't let them just run to their own conclusions. So, for example, with addiction, would we want them to think, my mother was addicted. That meant she wasn't worth making the choice to stay off drugs for me. I'm not good enough. Do we want to leave them with that as a conclusion? Absolutely not. And that's the kind of conclusion that they come to. Or, she didn't feed me. They really don't understand the concept of poverty in Haiti, for example. You know, or, by the way, the orphanage ran out of food uh, in the falls. There's graft, there's corruption. And that's why we didn't have enough to eat in that country. Not, it, they, they think it's something to do with them, that they weren't worth the care, and so forth. Or if they think of prostitution, they tend to, you know, and hit that without any preparation of it. They just think, you know, I've been related to the worst possible person, so embarrassing, I can't even stand it. Instead of understanding that in some countries, it's either prostitution or starving. Or when people get addicted, they feel like they're dying. Yes. Oh, you're waiting. Okay. Then when... Um, <laughs> People are addicted, they feel like they're dying without drugs sometimes, and they will do anything to survive that moment. And so we have to really build a basis of information for some really hard things. And then the cultural biases. How many of you are parenting a child who would have been maintained in the family if the child were a different sex? Quite a few of you. You know, especially our kids who are coming in from China, there aren't as many now. But a lot of those children, actually about 80% uh, of those girls have an older Chinese sister, you know, in a study that was done by uh, Kay Johnson. And so we end up with, you know, very difficult to explain situations to kids sometimes. So in the preschool years, we give very simple, concrete explanations that include concrete details, a very simple why. <coughs> so, you know, why can't I live with my, my birth mother? You know, your birth mother, and this would be if her child in foster care, we'd say, your birth mother doesn't keep enough food in the refrigerator. You know, there's a certain kind of thing, and I usually have a picture of what the substance is that she's addicted to. And that is her brain really wants that. And it's against the law, but she spends her money on that. And if she doesn't, she feels like she's really sick. And she spends her money on that instead of on, you know, food. 
but she doesn't have food. I mean, you go, and I often will do pictures with the kids so that they can understand it. Those of you who heard me talk a little bit yesterday and a bit this morning, you'll notice that a lot of the kids we work with have something called executive dysfunction, and that includes problems with uh, verbal memory. So a lot of times we'll do booklets for kids or do a picture with kids, and that way they can hold the parts of what you're talking about very simply. Or when I'm talking about poverty in other countries, kids maybe have a, an early memory that is pre-hippocampus. Our hippocampus has our narrative memory, which is when I was this age, this happened. But prior to, um, well, there's a, a window of 18 to 22 months when that starts to develop in most kids. But prior to that, they store memories in the sensory motor areas of their brain. And what's significant about that for us is they'll just have a feeling, but they won't have a context for that feeling. They'll hide the feeling, but the memory of abandonment or being alone, being hungry, being neglected will be more of a feeling memory. And so for those kids, when we try to explain poverty to them, they're like, well, why, at preschool, why don't they go to the store then? What's the problem? So usually I'll have pictures that really show what it's like to be very poor from some of the countries in, in, um, around the world, kids who are adopted internationally, or I'll have pictures of a place that really has no facilities, you know, the kind of place they were staying in. Or I'll describe places I've been in where uh, a parent is staying in basically a drug house with unsafe people, and what that looks like in there, and it being dangerous for children. Loud and scary, for example, if that's part of the child's history. And kids will say, well, why didn't she take me away from there? Why didn't he take me away from there? And one of the things you have to be prepared to talk about is, you know, often there's a drug problem, and that's why the parent is staying there. They give her that stuff that she got addicted to. And the kids will be like, well, you know, why, uh, why didn't she just say no to that, or why did she take that? She said, well, she didn't know that that was going to happen to her when she took it. But you're right, she should have said no. You know, but then she didn't, she kept say, not saying no, and it's against the law to have a child live in such an unsafe place. And the judge, and I'll draw a judge, or, and I have courtroom settings, the judge said that you needed to be in a safe home where it wasn't scary and you got enough to eat and you got safety where people weren't coming in and being loud and scary and hurting each other. And that's the place you were in. Notice it's unvarnished. It's the complete truth. You're not trying to hurt them, but you're giving them a very realistic picture. And so I'll have kids who come back later and say, you know, we hit this in class and they were talking about whatever the problem is. And I remember you talking to me about that. And then I didn't feel like I couldn't cope because I know about that and I've faced it in my own life. Okay. So right from the beginning, in very simple terms, you're giving them the straight skinny. And if you don't know something, you say, I don't know. But, you know, there are a few possibilities. For example, for a little girl who's, you know, where is my birth mom today? She lost her in Haiti. You know, what do you think she's doing? Well, she could be selling more just beside the street. That's a very common thing for people to do in Haiti. You know, try to get some information from the background so that you they can have a mental picture that isn't just terrifying. Many of the kids are really scared. It's like, maybe we should help my birth mother. You know, after all, she's back there in this bad situation. And if it's a thing of addiction, you can say, there are lots of people who are able to, trying to help her and are ready to help her, but she has to agree to it, okay? And so you're, you're pointing out whose job it is so they don't get into this codependent situation. In elementary school, more facts, more explanations. It's still pretty concrete because they don't have a lot of abstraction yet. But if your kids haven't started the conversation with you about 
their earlier life or their beginnings by age five or seven, excuse me, then you want to bring that up. Um, because many kids can't handle the formation of questions. It takes some abstraction to even know what to ask. And so you can go through ordinary questions that most kids want to know about. And you know, the list of questions were, did my birth mother like me? You know, did uh, my birth father know I was born if the birth parents weren't together? Do I have siblings? Is somebody looking for me? Were they married? You know, it, just very normal questions that a child of that age would ask for. How old was she when she had me? Do you think I'll see her again if there isn't current visitation and they're not in this, um, in, they're not in this area? Some kids need to have some stress regulation before we even start working with them. And what I mean stress regulation, some ways to calm down some of their feelings. You know, so I teach kids just some real simple ones. Let me go back here. And so, why doesn't everybody just reach, hold both arms like this, squeeze hard, give yourselves a big hug, then let go? How's that feel? Good. And that's just a really easy one for little kids to do. And then take a minute and put your hands beside your hips on the chair next to you and lift yourself up. Now lift yourself back down again. How's that feel? Feels good, right? Then take something next to you. Just stand up for a second. And there are flowers on the table, so I don't want you to pick up the table because, you know, there might be a kind of a problem with the balance here. But pick up the chair next to you or behind you, hold it, and then sit it back down again. Just really pick it up and then put it back down again. Thank you. How's that feel? Gives you a little bit of an exercise and release. But it causes you to take a big, big breath and go back. And let me give you another thing that you can do with the kids. You can go online and you'll see belly breathing for kids. It's a way of doing diaphragmic breathing. But I'm going to teach you square breathing. And we'll breathe out to the count of five, hold to the count of five, breathe in to the count of five, hold to the count of five. So we'll do it together. How's that feel? We did it nine times. It would slow your pulse, slow your respiration, and it would slow any kind of stress response that began happening in your body. And so we give kids some favorite things that they can do. Usually kids have two or three. Some of the boys and more physical girls love to pick up something really heavy on them through the teen years. And it's really kind of funny, you know, I've got a a yellow leather love seat in my office is pretty heavy. They'll just go over and just yank that thing up, be real proud of themselves, put it back down. But if they're stressed, they'll learn they can lift something and put it back down. But that releases some of the energy that flows into their body and helps them downregulate. Does that make sense? But have two or three th of these things that your kids like doing that helps them get rid of stress that's building. Because some kids don't want to feel worse than they more stress than they feel already by going into a conversation. So we want to help them out. Some other kids are a little worried about their missing of someone because they think if they miss them, that person might come into their life. This is a little boy who lived with a mom uh, who had FAS. And like a lot of people with FAS, she's having a very difficult time caring for her children. Does everyone know what FAS is, fetal alcohol syndrome? She had the full syndrome and was in special ed until she left school and hit the streets when she was 13. It was really a 
tragic situation. She did her best to take care of the kids, and her best uh, succeeded for a short period of time, and then she became addicted. And he's writing to her. I'll just give her a name here. Marie, er, Marie. he says, I miss you and want to see you. I'll never forget you, but I'll visit you only in my mind, or I'll look in my life book and remember you, because it scares me to think of the unsafe people you were with. So I won't come there. I still like you, though. <laughs> Loved him. Okay. And so, uh, for some of the kids, you have to reassure them. In this case, there was not an open adoption, and he um, felt much better keeping it somewhat anonymous. Here's something else that another child did in elementary school, just working through some of her life story. At the hospital, I have these templates from a book I buy. It's called uh, uh, The Life Book for Children with Developmental Disabilities. Here I am, The Life Book for Children with Developmental Disabilities. Spalding put it out years ago, and you can still find it remaindered. And that's Spalding for Children, which is part of the Children's Bureau. And so they'll just have a lot of pictures you can use. I know you can't see it clear back there, but this one's at the hospital. I was in a hospital. Now I'm a big girl. I'm nine years old. My birthday is September 5th. I love my birth mom so much. I'm sad she could not take care of me. Okay, notice how they're processing these issues. And this is the last time that she could live safely with her birth mother. And there's sadness there. There's this sense of resolution, too. Sometimes we have uh, kids who are kind of thinking of their life story. What would it be like if I were in a different situation? Again, this is from that same booklet series that I use. This is Why Do I Need a Family? And this little boy's got an arm around him by his mom. And he has me scribe for him. Right, this looks like it is right now. Somebody's got an arm around him. Why do I need a family? Because if I didn't have a family, I couldn't eat, and I'd have to drink dirty water, and I'd be lonely. So you can see he's pulling up his past experiences. I would have shaggy clothes. I would be lonely. I wouldn't have anybody to play with, to keep me safe, and to hug me. So he's processing information around his birth story in that situation. I just came to giving you some examples of work that kids this age typically do. In the preteen years, the explanations include more abstraction. Concepts and information are covered earlier, and they need given all over again since things have new meaning. Because when kids are abstract, they're very concrete. You know, we teach them states, capitals, facts. You know, what are the seven oceans? What are the planets? But when they get older, um, when the sexual hormones start to hit the body, that's when the hormones are going to hit the brain, and they can't think more abstractly. And they'll be thinking more in terms of uh, bigger questions. Well. Why, why couldn't she have a choice in that country? Why did she stay in that country? And you can talk about some of those social issues. Or um, why did she let that guy around me who sexually abused me? Didn't she know he'd sexually abused me? After all, he sexually abused her. And so some of those bigger questions you want to uh, unpack at that point and give them lots of assistance in thinking that through. And while you can use it, I really feel like any child who's been through moves and trauma should see a therapist who has a specialty in this area, who's conversant with these areas. But I like to have parents in my sessions so that kids can work on some of this with them either that or they can talk about it with the parents at the end of the session. Because there's something about all of us that when somebody knows our story and accepts us, then we feel that we are acceptable. That, you know, there's a shaming that goes on sometimes when we feel like we have some part of a loss 
or some part of a life circumstance and that we're less than. And when we are, when somebody comes in and it's like, thank you for sharing that with me or I know about that and I accept you authentically, that wasn't your choice, but you know, I, I can understand that that would feel really bad. I wish she'd made uh, a different choice. I wish she'd been in a family that allowed her to know she could make a different choice. We're raising you differently so that you can make different choices and have the courage to live a different kind of life. You know, that's the type of perspective that we have. And what we're not saying to kids is you're going to be a victim because this happened to you. Nor are we avoiding it. Instead, yeah, these are things that happen to you. Often we'll use the metaphor of a chapter book. A lot of the best stories have some really sad chapters. But your course will be to have the courage to overcome this or make meaning out of it. Or I was working with a boy this past month who had been raped earlier on in his life. And, you know, we were talking in terms of his sexuality, boundaries within his sexuality, and his own self-identity. And he said, I think I can be a stronger person because of what I've lived through. I know I can overcome it. I know others can. You know, because, and, and do you hear how we built that? So that he's got this sense of himself as an overcomer, and someone who could be strong in the broken places. Now, some other people say, not there yet, but I'm hoping for it someday. You know, it's, there are variations in how far people come and what their attitudes are. But it's not something that we're avoiding. Or maybe I can handle this yet, but maybe someday I will. Or I had a girl who came in to see me at 11 or 12, and she said, because I was raped as a small child, I noticed my parents are more protective of me than they are for my sisters. And she said, I kind of hate it and I kind of need it. Sometimes I feel sorry for myself and I think, what would I have been like if I hadn't been through that? I said, what do you think you will be, would have been like? And she said, I think I would have had more courage. And then we could talk about courage not being something you have without a challenge, but courage you have something with a challenge. You know, and we can transform that a bit. Because the point of view that we're trying to have for kids is not an empty rah-rah, but with help and support you can face it and you can go on and have a good life. You can be somebody who can be a person of comfort and care for somebody else who might be going through something similar. Does that make sense to people? But we're hitting it straight on. For early teens, they'll be figuring out how am I like and unlike these people who are their biologic relatives or in some places the culture they come from and how it will be like and unlike you, my parents. Everyone knows that teens, 12, 13, 14, they're figuring out how you like parents, how are you unlike them. However, when we've got kids who are in foster care or adoption, they're doing it for two sets of parents. So if you paint a picture of we are the good way and that is the bad way and we are the holy and they are the not holy and we are the ones who stay away from drugs and they're all like us and they're all a bunch of meth users. Then what are you setting yourself up for in teenage years? It just light them on fire because they're going to explode. You know, so what we want to do is really break that down. And I can think of one boy, I said, well, what I heard from the visits with your birth mother, she was a really nice person. Sadly, she got addicted. It's a bad problem in our society. We're not good at solving it. You know, and she was not in a family system that really encouraged her to know that she had the genetics for becoming an addict. Okay, so we hit it straight on. Well, what if I become like that? Well, what are the steps to becoming a drug addict? You know, it's not like you just go out one day and become a drug addict. So, you know, we can cover some of that information. Or I've got kids who have 
been exposed to a lot of alcohol prenatally. I use the words of Julie Bledsoe. You are allergic to alcohol, you know. But we hit the issues of addiction very early on. It's not that they're worse or better people, but they did become addicted, and with addiction, all these other problems come. Does that make sense? So. Yeah, the reason I turned around right here is I was looking to see if there would be a white pad, but uh, I, I was going to draw it, but I'll just talk talk about it. I'll figure out what substance they were probably addicted to. Sometimes I don't know, but you know, alcohol has been the ubiquitous one. Um, some people are probably drug users, but I'll put circles, concentric circles in. I say in the first circle, that's our first circle of love. And we want to live with those people because we want to be with them. And so who would be in your first circle of love? And kids will write their names in there. And, you know, sometimes the family dog's in the first circle of love. You know, they'll, sometimes the sibling is not in the first circle of love. <laughs> and, you know, they'll often put, like, maybe a birth parent and then their foster parents or an adoptive parent in that first circle. And then the second circle, those are people we're really close to, and we don't want to ever lose contact with them or lose their number. And we'll put those number or those people in there. And then those are the third circle folks next. And those are people who are really important in our life, but they might not be lifelong. And they'll put favorite teachers there, you know, maybe somebody for, who's a church connection, good friend of the family, uh, you know, somebody like that. And then I'll say, well, the problem with alcohol is when it gets in your first circle, it takes over and nobody else can live with it. And then you apply the facts, you know, because they get drunk and they get scary and they wreck up and they don't care of day-to-day -day things. We'll put your main facts to that child's life in that first circle. So everybody has to kind of move to the second circle, even though like, they love that person. And then I'll take like a pickle, and I'll take a cucumber, and I'll put them out together. I said, this pickle was brined, and that's what alcohol does to the brain. When you drink a lot, it shrinks and it doesn't work very well anymore. And so when she drank so much, it made it so she couldn't think right. And I'll have pictures of brains on meth or I'll describe what happens on meth visually or um, heroin, for example, whatever the drug is, called drug use. So they just couldn't think. They couldn't make decisions. They couldn't even take care of themselves, let alone a child. And that's what happened with addiction. That's why it's such a terrible problem in our country for kids, and about half a million kids have been in foster care most of the last 10 years. You know, our numbers are down around 400,000 now, but you know, it's um, still a huge problem in our country. And so we discussed some of that with them. What age do you, like, you said seven, but can you do it earlier? Or um, the question is, what age do you do this in? Can you do it earlier? The circles depend on cognition of about a second grade level. Okay. You know, and you can work on up with that with kids, you know, so that they can understand it. And you know, some kids will say, you know, a mom should give her child first place. And I say, yes, she should. And I said, and your job was, you know, if they've stayed with their birth parent for a period of time, you know what their job is. Every addict raises kids to take care of them. Okay? And so we could say, you know, your job was to try to take care of her so you could get a little bit back for yourself. That is as they got older. It would be really important for you to avoid those types of situations. You know, we describe the way those situations work out. You know, because it's the mom, dad's job to take care of them. In early teens, I have a lot of kids who have denial or idealization. And so for those kids, um, I kind of burst their bubble. I had a girl who was in to see me, boy, was she mad. 
because she had an idea of her birth mom as, you know, a, an artist who was kind of a free thinker and, you know, kind of some idealization about that, how someday they would get together and share their art. I was like, I, that would be just great, and I hope that's the case, that you can, but it's going to be really limited because she wasn't clean and sober, and, you know, her brother had suffered a pretty severe fate in that home. And she was like, Deborah Gray told me things I didn't want to know, you know, and she's hissy about it. And so <laughs> it's like, I wish I didn't have to be the one to tell you these things. I wish they weren't true. But I feel like I owe you the respect to know the facts about your life. And I just got an email a few weeks ago. So-and-so wants to come in and talk to you some more. She really likes you, and she's not mad at you anymore for <laughs> telling her. Because she said she had to find out. At least you were straight up with her. You know, and so you get that kind of a dialogue back with parents. There was a hand back here. Yes? How would you approach, like, the circles with a child who's a man because of gender or physical disability or something? Yeah, well, how do you approach the circles? I don't use circles for those kids. I talk about cultural beliefs. You know, different cultures have different beliefs. So I had one girl, just because she had... Um, a very mild congenital uh, syndrome was left at the hospital with a letter. And the letter is, you know, we've never had a child with a discipline in our family before. I don't know how this misfortune happened, but we don't want to raise this child. We're going to try again. And so I, mean, I was able to talk about, I mean, it's harsh, isn't it? And she sat in an orphanage till age eight Every day, waiting for somebody to come visit her, you know, her birth relatives were right in the village next door. It would have been just basically a, a, a walk up the hill, uh, three quarters of a mile walk. So, but she was still waiting. And we talked about, you know, just the reality of her denial. I talked to her about attitudes in that particular country towards disability some of the cultural beliefs around it, and some of the cultural beliefs in other areas about it. So she was shaped by cultural beliefs. Ignorance is always ugly. Prejudice is always ugly. And we went that direction with it. And she said, well, what am I wasting my life waiting for her for? <laughs> I said, well, I was kind of hoping you'd come to that conclusion. <laughs> you don't have to hate her. But she doesn't know how to handle a fairly easy problem for people to handle in this country. And so we're able to talk it through. But again, we're just processing facts. Actually, she drew a paper family of the ideal family, rumpled it up, stomped up and down on it before she came to some resolution. So some of the conflicting, conflicting thoughts they have are not often pretty ones. And we have to kind of interrupt them ourselves along the way that, you know, we don't want to leave them in that really negative spot. But on the other hand, um, you know, some of that anger is just part of the, the, the grief and rejection that they've experienced in the circumstance. Yes? So if your child comes from a country with discrimination against gender and there's probably been rape or something with the birth mom, at what age do you even broach that? Well, the question is, if your child has, um, it comes from a country in which there's discrimination against a particular gender and there may be rape in the background, when do you talk about it? Um, why don't I, because of the mid-teen thing, I'll do this slide and then answer your question. Mid-teen and beyond. What's my story and how does it influence who I am? That's a normal developmental level. You don't want to define, again, the person is a victim, but that the person has been influenced by their experiences or associations. If you say good is new, how, how does that fly? Yeah, 
Well, we would just say it and I'll go home. We wouldn't be coming for two days. And need the massage area and the you know, t TLC. All would be well. Would, we would be so suggestible. I'd probably figure out something to do for a living. But anyway, um, but the, the thing that we want to do is, yes, this has influenced you, but these are some helpful thoughts. These are not so helpful thoughts. Let's look to see, has this had a toxic effect on you? And what would be some ways that we could do either trauma work or rethink this so that you could reimagine yourself in a more robust way? Does that make sense? But then back to your situation, you know, because you want to inoculate them against shame. It's, they don't have anything to be ashamed of. But if I think that the child has been raped, and it's just a maybe, that is not something I dump on them. Okay? I had a boy I worked with, a uh, sister said that he had watched her rape, which he had, and she's a much older sister, but she said his birth father did it. And she already hated his birth father because he thought, you know, they had different birth fathers. Thought he, that this individual had something to do with the mom no longer being clean and sober. I talked to the mom who knew both of the individuals fairly well, and she said, I have a serious doubt that this really happened. And during a supervised visitation, this kid never flinched from the birth father. He never dissociated. He didn't show the signs of trauma I would have expected to see. Do you think I'm going to dump that story on him? No. And, you know, it's, some of this stuff is very potent. And if you know something bad happened, then you get there and you tell them, and you tell them with a lot of help. But if it's just like, maybe this could have happened, then maybe not so much, okay? And so I really give parents a lot of um, the decision-making in my therapy for something like that, not as an avoidance thing, but often they've got a gut sense of how that will affect their own child. It's not that we hide from it, but there are certain things that you can say that are very difficult for that child to process. And I think being a child who, whose birth parent, one of their birth parents break them as one of them. No, it's not that you can't work it through if it happened. But if there were other options, then I wouldn't necessarily jump into that one. I mean, it's not like we have to be network TV these days, right? Mm -hmm. Or cable. So, so I would more likely say, I don't know. You know, there are some possibilities, but I don't immediately jump on the worst of the worst unless we really have to face that one. Other people have a thought about that? Yeah, Any? yeah go ahead. We have some little fosters that are um, four, five, and six, and they're getting ready to lose rights to both their mommy and daddy. Mm -hmm. And so we're just um, needing to try and understand how, how should we present that to them at that age? Yeah, this, she said, we have little kiddos, uh, four, four, five, and six. four, five, and six, and termination of parental rights will be coming up. You know, how should we present it to them? <coughs> and this is one of the things that you can... Uh, Sit down with a child and say, what are the good things you want to remember about being with your birth parents? You can do it individually with the kids at that age uh, if you want to, or you can do it as a group. The four-year-old will have some you know, input. And then you can say, what are the things that you never want to forget? Like one little boy was going into bed in, in this emergency foster home. He said, my birth mom's name is Melinda. Would you write down that name somewhere? I don't ever want to forget it. Okay, just it's it's wrenching, isn't it? You know, it was right in that age range. But you write down a lot of things that they never want to forget, and then 
you also have a pager. What are some things that they can't give you, things that you need? And then you have pictures for those, or you write those down, you scribe those down, and then say, what the judge does is he says, we're going to give you some time. And, during, and you know, give them a, an idea of how, how long that time is. Two years, 18 months, year and a half. And say, you have that much time to show me you can have a safe house with enough food and that you're not um, using drugs. It, not the drugs from the drugstore that the doctor gives you, but illegal drugs that you make up yourself that are kind of like poison. You know, you, that helps them understand, because most of them have seen that green guy on poison control. And so, and the judge said, I'm sorry, we can't wait anymore. And so, these kids need not to move, 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 move between families. They need to stay where they're at right now. It's not your choice. You could have been the best, best kids in the world. Or the worst, worst kids in the world, and the judge would not have changed her mind. Okay, and you describe it that way. Many of our kids, people have said, would you like to stay in this home? And they think they've made that decision. And so you, in your explanations, you're being very clear that adults have made these decisions. Or some kids have wished, like, I wish she'd go away and I never would see her again. Well, how many of you thought this about your parents growing up? <laughs> you know, if parents disappeared, how would you feel? You know, my husband tells a story of getting the meanest nun when he was growing up. He went to Mass and he's like, Dear God, let something happen so I don't have Sister Benito, you know, and uh, she died. <laughs> and, <laughs> he felt simultaneously most relieved and really quite guilty. <laughs> you know? and, of course, later he realized, you know, the reason she was in such a terrible mood is poor nuns dying of cancer and trying to eke out her last days in service, you know. But... Those are the kinds of abstract things you figure out later on, which is one of the reasons why you cross this kind of thing with kids, you know. That, so you can go through some of these explanations, not Sister Benito, but, you know, that the judge has made this decision because it's against the law for kids not to have food, to leave kids at home alone, and nobody comes, you know, you know that this isn't their decision. And, how, and I talk about prostitution when kids get to a more abstract age, unless they have memories about it. Okay. And, but I want them to have a concept of an addictive drug first, because it's almost always drugs or extreme poverty in another country. And so how I talk to them about that is, what do you do if you don't have any money and you need to eat and you need a safe place to stay and there aren't any shelters and nobody else you know has money, what do you do? That would be with poverty. And they're like, I got nothing. Well, actually, they'll start giving you some things out of their context and you're able to discuss how that wasn't available. And then you go on and say, well, this is really, really sad, but if you have somebody who, uh, if you have somebody without any money and any resources, what they agree to do is to go take off their clothes and let another t person touch them and be with them in a sexual way. And that's what she had to do. And they'll be like, oh, oh, I'm mad at her, I don't like her. Or I explained it to a boy at one point. And, um, you know, he had kind of known what was going on. But he sat and he thought about it. And he said, I always knew she was a prostitute from what my old therapist told me. But I didn't know she was a whore. Mm -hmm. He said, I'm really mad at her for doing that. Okay. And so there's a, a normal, like, anger that a person would have let themselves get to that situation. And, you know, so... 
It's, if it's a situation with addiction, you can let them know how disappointed everybody is that it's turned that, that way, and especially how she's let herself down. Go ahead. So, I hope I'm not jumping ahead too much, but how do you deal with just that identifying with that, you know, that they think that might happen to them? Or? And how do you deal with how you identify that they, that, that's why you process it so carefully. How do you know that this wouldn't happen to me? And so you're like, well, first of all, we're going to practice really early. You not, and you knowing that you're allergic to drugs and alcohol. If you get into trouble and start using drugs and alcohol, it is going to be off to rehab with you, sonny boy, real fast. <laughs> and, you know, for you blink because both your birth parents were addicts, and there's a genetic piece to this. And so, you know, we will be on it quickly. So one of the kids I uh, counseled, actually I counseled his sister, counseled him a, a, just a couple sessions. I had a colleague who had him as a client. It's part of some family sessions. He started using heroin. He was immediately in rehab. You know? And if it's mental illness, we'll say, you know, this person, you really was not able to take care of herself. She was talking to people that nobody else saw or heard. You know, and she didn't have the right medicine that would help her. And part of what she did to get food was she would take off her clothes and instead of being with somebody who really loved her and treated her body in a loving way, she would just let them use her body like a toy. And then they would give her money or a place to sleep. You know, you can go that direction with it. Or you can talk. In, in some cultural contexts, I've only had to do this like once or twice, but I've had a person who was in a situation where her family was desperately poor and her job was to prostitute for the extended family, for her brothers, you know, for her parents. And, um, you know, that was just something that she did for them and took that lower status position. And it's not like I aggrandized that, but I would say certainly for you, we'll make sure you have different skills so that you always have a way to make your way. It will make you a hard worker and a strong worker so you can always make your way. And that's one of the reasons why, you know, one of the things we love about the U.S. is we have these opportunities and we're so seldom in these situations. Okay. So, I had a girl who went through this kind of situation, she, this, or this conversation, and she says, I'm having a hard time finding the grief here, Deborah Gray. I think I just got really lucky to get out of there. You know? <laughs> <laughs> she's a very practical sort, you know, she's going to be an engineer or an architect or something like that, you know, just like, I looked at the pros and cons, and I'm way ahead on this one. <laughs> And so I had put some examples down here that we could go through, but you've uh, brought up some other ones. Well, we have parents who are uh, killed at a young age. Kids will identify with those early deaths. And so it's really important to go back through that with them, describe the circumstances and what they will do differently to have a different outcome. Okay. And so that's an important thing to know if you have a parent, birth parent who's died by suicide, accident, something like that, there's an increased risk of early death and there's kind of this ominous cloud over. So you want to carefully process how that occurred, what steps are going to be taken in their lives so that they don't run those risks. Does that make sense? Yes. Oh, five minutes to wrap up. And I know, I don't, I'll do this again next year if they invite me. And, <laughs> <laughs> and then about sexual offenders. I do want to hit this one because a lot of the kids have been sexually abused or they've lived with a sexual offender. And it's like, how did they ever let that thing happen? Um, I'm not going to talk about this particular case. I'll just give you a bigger, I didn't know you were going to ask me some good questions. So this is just in case there was no discussion that we're seeing these uh, vignettes up here. But what we talk about is if you have a birth parent who's being raised with sex abuse, 
they're not good at getting their boundaries up. Instead, they kind of deny and go away in their mind. And what happens then is where everybody else is thinking, man, there's something kind of creepy about that guy. He gets too close. What's he come wanting more time with my daughter or my son for? Instead, they're like, da 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 and you know they're just not protecting. They find, they don't have the ability to have boundaries. I mean that would be one thing. I have had kids who were sold drugs for sex, sex with a child by a predator. And I say that there are these really creepy people who thinks that sex is really fun to have when it hurts a small helpless child, or sex should be between be between an adult and a child and that's wrong. Some countries, they kill you for it. In this country, they like to put you into jail for a really long time because it's so weird and bad for kids, even if they liked part of it and got something from it. And I'll just say, this predator knew that your birth parents were in job taking care of you, and they were watching for a time that they could take advantage of you. Or if it's drug for sex, this predator knew that your birth mom was addicted and she took advantage of that. And, you know, usually in a situation like that, you help them build up enough of a boundary that they're not going to expose themselves to situations like that in the future. Certainly, you're not encouraging any kind of continued visitation. And that's one thing I want to mention is sometimes when you have kids who are checking in, could I see this guy, could I see that guy? There's sex abuse in the background, kid is really acting out a lot. We think maybe we should open up visitation. Sometimes it's not that. They're checking to see if it's safe to tell. So really watch out for that one. Because sometimes kind of, especially soft-hearted therapists tend to open the door too quickly. Oh, must be about grief. Well, sometimes it's about basic safety. I can remember one girl I worked with uh, she kept asking for her aunt and uncle who prostituted. It turned out they prostituted her. And I said, I know you really want to see them, but tell me what you want to do and why it's so important now while you're young. She said, well, they're kind of old and they use drugs. And I'm afraid they're going to die before I can get them back. I want to beat them up. Okay? Very different kind of reaction. So don't jump to assumptions. When kids ask me questions, sometimes I think, I say, well, I'd like to hear what you think about that first. And then you get more out of that memory situation than you would ever guess. And it lets you know which, which path to go down. Does that make sense? I know this is kind of a heavy session. So, oh, it's one minute. I was trying to finish up here on a, an upbeat note. <laughs> ha. But I, I'll just go through like two slides. Supply facts, what really happened. Correct distortions of the facts. We almost always make patterns that get us a little too close or too far away from certain of our favorite facts. Help them to make meaning out of the facts. Help them to reset appropriate expectations while others like them authentically. Do others need them to be cheery or to say things that they never uh, that they never think about these things or they can't remember significant events or can they be authentic about it? Help children to form a timeline with events and their feelings on a line. Discuss how you would have treated them, how their feelings are connected to events. Draw a picture of the life you wish you had, mourn it, discuss it. What would your life have been like? Say goodbye to this life gently. And embrace the life you've got instead. And start to think how you can go on to have a good life. What are the elements to that? What are the steps, to, uh, steps to, towards success? And actually draw, have them draw a path. And that path is the road to good life. And what that path has on its, its steps and what we're going to do to make sure that they have a good, fulfilling, courageous, meaningful life.
Okay. Okay, thanks so very much, folks. Yeah.